16 people share real life encounters with notorious serial killers. Number one, Charles Manson. My mother ran with Charles Manson for a little bit. She's kind of crazy so she got taken up in his charming personality and his passionate words. He was young and energetic. The hippie movement was in full swing and that was really appealing with people like my mother. I honestly don't know why she ended up splitting from the group. I'd like to think it was that she caught a vibe of what was to come, but more likely than that, she just couldn't afford the bus ticket to get back to the group after a trip home. Jeffrey Dahmer My coworker was working with Jeffrey Dahmer at the Ambrosia factory when he was arrested, third shift by the way. He likes to tell the story about the news report. There was a dude at the plant who freaked everyone out. He didn't talk and no one talked to him. Let's call him Matt. One day, news breaks that someone from the plant was arrested as a suspect in a serial killer case. When the employees arrive that night, they're all waiting for everyone to get there so they can talk about it. To their surprise, Matt comes walking in the door. None of them expected it to be Jeff. Tex Watson Manson Family My mom dated Tex Watson from the Manson family. They went to the same university, North Texas State in Denton, Texas. She announced it in passing as if it were common knowledge while we were watching some documentary and Roman Polanski's name came up, to which she nonchalantly said something along the lines of, My ex-boyfriend murdered his wife causing me to inquire further about picking my jaw up off the floor. Apparently their relationship was pretty short-lived, and he was good-looking and fairly normal. Gary Ridgway, aka the Green River Killer My coworker used to chat with Gary Ridgway up in Washington State. He was waiting for his then-girlfriend to get off work at a truck stop, and Ridgway was a regular there. He said Ridgway was very polite and friendly, and would even walk the girls to their car at night because they were worried about the killer on the loose. How thoughtful, Gary. Albert DeSalvo, aka maybe the real Boston Strangler. Most people, if you ask them about this case, would disagree adamantly. If you look at all the facts, it looked like DeSalvo just wanted his 15 minutes of fame. The man desperately seeked attention every chance he got. My grandparents knew the Boston Strangler. He was a gentleman and often gave my grandmother a ride home because my grandfather asked him to. To this day she claims he was innocent, but my grandfather insists he was guilty. Robert Burdella. I didn't know him well. But in high school, I shopped at a store called Bob's Bazaar Bazaar that was owned by Bob Verdella. I bought a Bengal bracelet there. I only met him one time. He seemed like a creep and a misogynist. Just an impression I got. He did support the local pagan community, though, and funded a magazine in which I published a couple of poems. I was shocked a few years later when the news came out that he had men's bodies buried in his backyard. I threw that Bengal bracelet away. In fact, I buried it. Kind of ironic. BTK, Mr. Raider as I knew him, went to my Nana's church. My whole mom's side knew and met this man. He once gave me a cookie and complimented my dress at a bake sale. My mom would go to his house when she was younger to do church stuff. My uncles knew him from their scouts group. He'd drive everyone home before their 6 p.m. curfew they all had because BTK was still out there. Everyone flipped their shit when he got caught. I was still living at my mom's when he was caught. She got a call from my grandma frantically telling her to put on the news. The rest of the night was spent listening to my mom playing phone tag with everyone she knew. No one could believe it. My mom was the most freaked out because as the only girl out of five kids, and she'd gotten lots of rides from him home, alone. He easily could have done something, you know? I didn't know Mr. Raider well, 
just saw him every couple years when we would pack up and stay with family in Kansas for school breaks. He seemed like a quiet old dude from Nana's church, just like every other old dude there. Amy Herrera, aka the Albuquerque Black Widow. The woman known as the Albuquerque Black Widow. She killed her second husband, my uncle, a medical student and medic in Vietnam, after a nasty separation. He had borrowed a truck from a friend to take her belongings to her new house. Story has it, they argued, resulting in her shooting him multiple times. She claimed that he showed up drunk and beat her, but the coroner's toxicology report found no trace of drugs or alcohol. Also, after he had been shot, she beat his face with a pistol so badly it broke the pistol butt. Her uncle, a prominent local attorney, was the first on the scene and helped craft the self-defense narrative with the police. She was never charged with a crime. Twenty years later, she killed her third husband, a local politician, when she discovered that he had been having an affair with another woman and was planning on leaving her. She hid in the basement of their shared home, ironically the same house inherited from my uncle, and shot him when he came home. She claimed self-defense, that she thought it was a burglar. The police didn't buy it and she was charged with the crime, although once again her high-powered attorney made mincemeat of the prosecution. To my knowledge, no one ever found out what happened to her first husband. What she was like? She was a large woman with a very intense presence. When she was around the family, she made an effort to be Sasher and Sweet but her intensity put everyone on edge. She was constantly telling small lies and obsessing over defending or justifying them. She absolutely had to control the narrative and her image. One of the most shamelessly manipulative people I've ever met. I distinctly remember her vibe. As soon as she walked into the room, you knew there was something not right with this person. In private, she would wait at home for my uncle to return from school or work and ambush him with any kind of grievance she had. They lived close by, so it was easy to hear them arguing. One day, a nurse from the hospital called and tried to leave a message. When my uncle returned, she accused him of having an affair and flew into a rage, which ended with her locking herself in a bathroom with a pistol, threatening to kill herself. The local sheriff was called, but did nothing until my uncle broke down the door and talked her down. But after that, things changed. My uncle had legally adopted her daughter from her first marriage and was hesitant to leave them, but it became apparent that that was the only course of action, and then she killed him. But yeah, the warning signs were there. Last I heard, she was working in a hospice somewhere in British Columbia. The thought of that creature around patients sends shivers through my spine. My mom worked with one of the brothers and sister-in-laws of Ivan Malat, Australian serial killer who killed and buried many female hitchhiking backpackers in the forest. And she said the brother was very friendly, polite and normal to work with. They had no idea that he was responsible for the murders and as shocked as everyone else is when they found out. She also told a story about Ivan hiding knives in the walls of a house that they were working on, between the frame and the plaster board. The forest is actually less than 30 minutes away from our house, so my young sisters and I had actually camped in the backyard with other young children of another family that lived there. We also cut down a Christmas tree from the forest before all the bodies were discovered. My cousin is a bayou strangler. Ronald Dominique. He killed over 23 people but the world didn't really care because they were poor gay men. Especially in the deep rural south, we still have a lot of homophobic people out here so it just wasn't cared about that much. There's so much to the story it's hard to explain everything but just know, he was in a vicious cycle of abuse. He grew up destined to be fucked up basically. Doesn't excuse what he did though and my heart goes out to the families of the victims. Lord have mercy, that's a long story and I really don't want to out too much of the family history. 
but my dad who grew up next door to him growing up said he witnessed a lot of abuse and starvation and simply weird practices going on in their home. Things like the parents eating steak for supper and the kids getting one half of a hot dog weenie each. The kids would ask people for food often. Then the mom was caught sleeping with her own brother. The dad found out about this, told all the kids that their mom was sleeping with her brother. I haven't heard this story in a long time, and these details might be somewhat wrong, but they had a camper in the middle of the woods, or somewhere remote, and the dad found out that's where his wife was meeting her brother for sex, and he took his kids out there one night to catch her in the act, and cause a big scene. The kids are all messed up like none of them are normal. It was his own sister who helped turn him in though. I think that sister is the most normal out of the whole group. One of the brothers was a petty criminal for a while, but according to his daughter he has turned his life around ever since Ronald was caught. Oh, the other brother is a rapist who raped a girl like every year at the local state fair. Literally he raped a girl at the fair, went to jail, got out two years later, went to that fair that year, raped another girl, got out in six years. The year he got out he went to the fair and raped again. I think he's still there now. It's a long running joke that after they let him out they need to just put him in a jail cell the week of the fair because he never raped anyone that we know of any other time. My aunt worked closely with Michael Swango, aka Dr. Death at the OSU Medical Center. She was a unit secretary of neurosurgery, and he worked as a surgeon. She said he was very charming, almost to a superficial point. She also said his bedside manner was awful, and he was always obsessed with death. She didn't initially think much of it, since that's surprisingly common among doctors. The thing that got her suspicion was how whenever he brought in food for his co-workers, everyone in the ward seemed to get sick. He was extremely handsome and women loved him, so he got around with many of the nurses and even asked out my aunt. She politely declined since she was dating the man who would later become my uncle, but one night one of his dates was snooping around his kitchen. She found recipes for different poisons taped on the inside cabinet. She came back and told my aunt and a few others what she saw and they reported it. Right around this time a large amount of patients started dying. Keep in mind, neurosurgery in the early 90s was far from where it is today and had a much higher mortality rate. But before they could catch him, he killed a bunch of patients and fled the state. He eventually ended up in Zimbabwe and killed tons of people there as well. U.S. officials somehow tricked him into coming back to the U.S. and he was arrested and given life without parole. Fred West my dad knew Fred West. He says that he acted like a kind man who would always offer his help. He was put off by how he would talk to children, especially his own. He also thought it was weird how many men would enter Fred's house. Little did he know they were having sex with Rose. It still haunts him that he did not live far away from a man that would torture his own children and is thankful that nothing ever happened to my sisters. My grandfather also worked with Fred. He would say about how he would always buy him coffee in an attempt to build a friendship, which led my grandfather to think of him as just friendly, but lonely, but there was obviously a much darker side to him. Thank you guys for watching and listening to the end. If you would like to have your story featured on an upcoming video, email my email in the description box below. And please be sure to leave a like on this video and subscribe if you're not already subscribed, and be sure to turn the notifications on. Until we meet again, stay sinful. So this happened in 2019 in Chicago when I was 27 and my ex-girlfriend was 23. And I don't remember why we ended up at McDonald's that day because she didn't like eating fast food. But what happened there still haunts me, even though there was no physical altercation or anything. It was just off is the best way to put it, and I think it's possible someone attempted to traffic her or us, and 
I wanted to share this to get opinions or maybe see if anyone has had a similar encounter in Chicago because I've always had the impression that the man who approached us was in a familiar environment. So, for context, my ex is very pretty. I'm also a fairly big dude with cauliflower ears and tattoos, so men rarely approached her when we were out together. But this guy was different, and just thinking about his eyes still makes me feel a, a flight or fight response. We were sitting off by ourselves, doing the annoying couple thing where you both sit on the same side of the table. We were also back against a, a wall facing into the rest of the seating area. The McDonald's wasn't very busy that day, and this dude just kind of appeared a few feet away from our table. And even that is strange to me too because I tend to be hypervigilant in public spaces because of some stuff that I've been through, but this dude was just there all of a sudden. He wasn't a particularly big man or anything, maybe a bit under six feet tall I would guess. I'd say mid to late 40s and wearing business formal clothes. I remember the clothes because he was wearing a sort of burgundy dark red tie against a blue shirt though I don't remember if he had a suit jacket on or not. But again, it was his eyes that really caught me or us off guard. I don't know if it was just the way that he caught us off guard, but remembering his eyes afterward was the first time that I ever questioned if the paranormal was real. They were so intense, I can still sort of see them. Very blue, and he didn't blink as he sort of shifted them from her to me, then back to her. And he smirked at me before fixating on my ex. Then he stepped forward, took one of my fries, dipped it in my own ketchup and said, The ice cream here is good, but it's not my favorite. Before putting the fry in his mouth and chewing it with the smirk not changing on his face. But he didn't blink at all, mind you. Just stared at my ex, chewed my fry, swallowed, kind of flicked his tongue out of his mouth, paused for a moment, then started to talk. I don't remember his words exactly, but my ex and I ran it back and forth enough times that I have a, a fairly good recollection of a lot of it. The first thing that he said post-fry was, I have the ability to change your life. Then he said something about flying to Florida or driving to get milkshakes. Yeah, milkshakes. Then he said, 40,000 would change your lives, wouldn't it? I have much more than that. Then he looked at me and said something like, I bet you'd trade something precious for $100,000. And please note that neither my ex or I had said anything at this point. I also don't think he'd blinked even once. And just the weirdness of what he talked about as if he was trying to entice us to go with him or something. He said something about a secret room in a church on the, the mile. The ex said that she thought that he might have meant the magnificent mile and a high place in New York that he'd take us to. And then, I declined for us. I don't even remember what I said to decline. He said something about showing us a computer that no one knows about. The ex and I both thought that we remembered him saying quantum computer, but I'm not sure. But that we wouldn't understand the future when we saw it anyway. And he just looked at her with no blinking. Then, when we didn't respond, his eyes sort of shifted to me. He looked me directly in the eye and said something that's burned into my mind. He said, I can pay someone millions to bring her to me, or you, so you better put a ring on it. I mean, what the heck, right? Then he took another fry, dipped it, ate it, and then left the McDonald's. I'm pretty sure that he didn't blink once the entire time that we spoke to him. So, I really don't know. My ex and I had multiple discussions about whether or not the encounter really happened or if we must have just hallucinated it, but we weren't on any drugs and both of us remembered the same stuff. And something that bugs me too is that we both felt kind of, I don't know, like hypnotized or paralyzed. And that's definitely not like me. Very disconcerting. I also don't know if this dude was on drugs either, but part of what's haunting beyond the eyes, or maybe because of them too, is that his face kind of looked like a mask, which I don't think it was a mask, but something hit our uncanny valley and I still wonder what would have happened if we would have left that McDonald's with him. Though, the feeling that I have is that it wouldn't have been good. Anyway, 
It was a really weird experience, and later on I found out that uh, I think the person that we interacted with was actually a, a Chicago billionaire. His name is Kenneth Griffin, and some Redditors actually provided me with some press receipts that match details from the McDonald's conversation that I wrote about, which is totally mind-blowing, I know. And I'm nearly certain that this was the dude that I spoke to that day. Back when I was still working in a rehab facility as a social worker for girls who were victims of SA, it was out of town, I would take a jeepney and a bus as well to get to my workplace. I was an in-house social worker, meaning that I would stay at the facility for five days, and I get two days off after this. My shift is Saturday to Wednesday, meaning that I can go back home Wednesday evening and return to the rehab facility Friday evening too. Now, I like to travel during evenings since there are not a lot of passengers and I can enjoy my window seat alone. The facility is located in a rural area. I can take a tricycle going through there to the bus stop, but it's too expensive for me, so I would always walk alone and, mind you, I have to pass through a wide sugarcane field before going there. There's not usually any streetlights there, but I didn't mind it, except, well, for this one night. So just near the road was a, a small mum and a pop store where I would usually buy my stacks. It's like a kilometre away from my workplace. I go close with the owner and she would often offer that she will ask her son-in-law to drive me to my workplace. I always politely decline her offer because I don't want to be a burden. But this time she offered again and I took it because when I looked down the road going to my workplace, it was really dark and... I don't know, the air felt just heavy and weird. So I finished my Pepsi and cigarette and hopped on the back of the motorcycle. When we reached the middle part, there were five to seven drunken men talking in the middle of the road and saw us coming. One guy said, Miss, come down and talk to us. I got pretty scared by that and he came closer. The son-in-law instantly drove his motorcycle fast and some of the men chased us while calling after me. Thank goodness, too, that they were not able to keep up. Now, if I hadn't have trusted my instincts that night, honestly, I don't know what would have happened to me. An acquaintance of mine who happened to have been a cop once told me this little tale that he experienced several years ago. Back then, he was a deputy and still new to the patrol scene. Since he was new to it, he got called often to more simple tasks, tasks that made the more experienced deputy's jobs easier. One night, the deputy got a request over his radio to sit on a, a suicide scene. The victim was still inside the home and they needed the deputy to sit and guard the main entry to the home until the coroner got there to take the body. They didn't want any relatives or anyone else to enter the scene and mess up evidence. Basically, that was a standard procedure too. So, the deputy got to the home of the victim and confirmed with the cops already on the scene that he was there to wait for the coroner. It was the middle of the night, so the deputy grabbed his flip phone out of his patrol car and settled on the front porch to play some snake on his phone. All was totally quiet around him after everyone else left, all the deputy could hear were the occasional sounds of distant barking dogs and the faint sounds of the sparse highway traffic. The silence did indeed make him a little bit nervous, especially considering what lied only a few feet away from him and invisible to him only because of the wall. And so, as you can imagine, it was only natural that his instincts had his ears on high alert. And he was startled when he suddenly thought that he heard a, a rustling sound seemingly coming from inside the house behind him. All he could do was sit there and wait and listen intently. A few minutes went by though and he didn't hear anything else, so he just figured that he probably heard the house settling or something. Over half an hour went by and the deputy was starting to get a little drowsy, staring at Snake on his small flip phone, so he flipped it shut and sat back for a few minutes to relax. But then suddenly there was that sound again, 
which seemed louder this time. A strange rustling sound, like maybe rustling papers he thought to himself, puzzled. As he sat there and listened intently, he heard it again and that time he was sure that it was coming from inside the house behind him where the victim was. At that point, the deputy admits that he was pretty scared. He didn't want to call for backup until he was sure that there was somebody inside the house, but he also didn't want to go inside the dark, creepy death scene by himself to investigate either. So he stood up and waited once again for any noise while resting his hand on the gun in his belt. Then the deputy drew his gun as a loud sound from behind him caused him to spin around and face a large window by the front door covered by vertical hanging blinds. As he turned around to face the window, an explosion of movement disturbed the vertical blinds. The deputy did admit to me in the telling of this story that he did in fact definitely jump and scream, as most anyone would I suppose. The deputy's vision quickly cleared and he stared at the face on the other side of the window, definitely not expecting to see that particular face staring back at him. The deputy screamed and went wide-eyed. The face staring back at him made a startled sound with wide-eyed as well. Then, for a quiet moment, these eyes and this officer, they stared at each other before the officer went in and when he did, nobody was there. He called for backup after this and they scoured that house, but nobody was there. The deputy admitted to me after telling me this story that he felt that that was one of the most scariest instances that he'd ever had in his entire career. So something terrifying happened last night and I just need to tell someone. I was sitting in my recliner last night, which is by a window, when I heard a man's voice just outside whisper. However, a very loud sort of shouting whisper as one would use to scold a child in a church or something. Say, yo, he's still awake. I'm a strong guy and I do have the means to protect myself, but in my vulnerable state, I felt true fear. I froze for a few seconds, then got up and looked out the window, but saw nothing. My house is in a heavily wooded area, so they could have got to the forest before I got to the window, I suppose. The blinds were closed but not shut, so yeah, it just freaked me out. I'm going to adopt a, a dog today from the animal shelter I ran because I need a friend to watch my back and give me that heads up when he hears them the next time they come. However, I just want to say that it's rare that I feel every hair on my body rise in terror like that. This happened almost six months ago and I still don't understand it. My roommate occasionally has sleepovers with her boyfriend which meant that I would stay home alone for a night or two. I never minded that though, until that one day. I must have stayed awake until 2am studying for a test that I had the next day. Everything went as usual when I went to sleep. I looked out front door, turned off all the lights, then closed my bedroom door, turning off my light, and I fell asleep. But at some point, I suddenly woke up and my vision was very blurry. My lights were on and almost blinding me. Then I noticed my door was open and all the other lights were on too. I kept staring at my door for a few seconds, then I suddenly saw a, a creepy figure leaning to the side staring back at me. It was a, a very tall man dressed in all black, face somehow painted black, and I couldn't tell any of his facial features other than his eyes. They were piercing, and he had sort of white, almost silver long hair falling to his knees. But we just sort of stared at each other, and then I, I thought that I couldn't move. But then, all of a sudden, I sat up and followed him as if it was a friend of mine or a family member. I wasn't scared, I was very calm, but... I stopped once I reached my bedroom's entrance. He walked to my open front door, looked at me one last time, and smiled, and then left. Now, I woke up again thinking that it was just a stupid nightmare, but when I did, my lights were on, my bedroom door was open, all the lights in my house were on, and my feet, they had floor dust on them. 
I ran to my front door hoping that it wasn't open and it was locked, but for some odd reason, my keys weren't attached to the lock, which is a safety measure of mine. I freaked out when I noticed I was late for my test, so I immediately dismissed whatever happened, until a few days later when I asked a friend of mine who thought that I was sleepwalking, but I never sleepwalk, I don't even talk in my sleep, and I'm still to this day terrified. I literally beg my roommate not to leave and any time she asks why, I just can't tell her knowing that she won't believe me. Does anyone know what that was? Does anyone have any ideas of what I should do? In late 2020, I was working at a chain hotel off the interstate. I won't say which hotel, but it is a major brand. I was training a co-worker for the night audit shift. She and I are both female, mid-twenties. Around 3am after all the paperwork for the day was done, I decided to show her the different room types, starting with the largest suite up on the third floor. Upon arriving on the third floor, we got off the elevator, started walking down the hall, and noticed a man who was sweating profusely just standing in the doorway of his room. He definitely seemed intoxicated at the least. We walk by him, greeting him as one does, and get no response. The fear was definitely suddenly palpable. We get to the suite, I'm showing her, and as soon as the door shuts, I say that guy is giving me a weird vibe. I don't think that we should walk past him again to get back to the elevator and suggest that we instead continue down the hall to the stairs. As soon as we exit the room, we immediately notice the man is now not only not back in his room but facing us and watching us. I whisper to her, girl, take your shoes off, we're going to run down the steps and out into the parking lot, okay? She agrees. We take off our shoes at the top of the stairwell and bolt down the steps and out into the parking lot. We enter back into the building and we run into the office and check the cameras. And sure enough, that man had followed us down the steps and was now looking for us in the hallway by the door to the parking lot. We check the reservation tied to the room number so I can inform my manager and tell them to place this person on the do not rent list. I remember that his name was extraordinarily normal, really unforgettable, like it could have been John Smith. But anyway, jump forward to late 2021 and I turn on the local news and see this man who followed us down those steps that night. His name was Anthony Robinson, now dubbed the shopping cart killer, who killed two women in Harrisonburg and two more that we know of in Northern VA. He is known to have utilized hotels to meet and then victimize women he was communicating with online. This was my only close encounter and definitely creepy in hindsight. I was a, a pretty and relatively smart 15 year old girl. A good kid who did well in school despite a tough childhood. I was working at an amusement park full time during the summer. The area that I lived in could be sketchy, but having grown up with little to no adult supervision, I was used to trying to look out for myself. But my father was out of town, mother was long out of the picture, and my sister, three years older, and myself were staying at our home alone. So, I finished work at 11pm when the park closed, and walked home by myself as I usually did. It wasn't far, maybe 10 minutes. I arrived home and my sister was still out somewhere and I got ready for bed, putting my pajamas on and crawled into bed. I was starting to fall asleep but I heard a small noise. I didn't know what it was but it didn't seem like a usual house noise I guess you could say. My bedroom was on the second floor with stairs leading up. I didn't hear anything after that noise, didn't investigate, just chalked it up to nothing. I started to fall back to sleep when I heard what sounded like, I don't know, hesitant footsteps on the stairs. I was instantly awake because of this, but in my mind, it was my sister coming home and climbing the stairs where her bedroom was. 
Still in bed, I yelled out, Wendy, Wendy, is that you? I heard nothing back. I yelled again, Wendy, is that you? But nothing, just more footsteps. I was pretty petrified, but as I tell the story to this day, I don't understand some of my reactions that night, so I really can't explain them, but I got out of bed, opened the ajar bedroom door fully, and went out to the stairs. Where I stood at the top, below me about halfway up the stairs, was a man that I had never seen before. He looked to be in his early 20s, a little taller than my 5'7", not a big guy, but solid with blonde curly hair. I asked him what he was doing. His reply was a garbled mess of something along the lines of, Where's Wendy? My mother told me not to get mixed up with women. Where's Wendy? From his manner and wide-eyed look, he seemed like he may have been doing drugs or something. Apparently, he had followed me home from the park and was asking, Where's Wendy? in response to my calling out for her. For some reason... I got very angry and not just scared and started screaming at him to get out, get out of the house, that I was going to call my father and Wendy and he needed to just get out. To my surprise, he did. He turned around, ran back down the stairs and I didn't see where he went after that but it turns out that he must have left. Now, I have no idea how he got in but he was definitely there for me and that's why he followed me not burglary or anything else. I think that he was looking to get his hands on me and who knows what else. I do think that the only reason that he left was because he had no idea where my sister Wendy was, thought that she was in the house and it was an added complication to him getting caught. I was obviously very shaken. I stayed up the rest of the night. I didn't call the cops, didn't call a friend. The only person I told actually was my sister the next day. I really don't know why. I just sort of sat in a rocking chair clutching my cat and rocking and crying, staying awake until the next morning. My sister never did come home that night. She stayed at a friend's and came home the next day. This happened 35 years ago and I haven't told anyone until now. So my husband dated a beauty queen title holder of a well-known pageant before me. They broke up long before we met, but she was a statuesque blonde, very tall, a knockout in her day, in my opinion anyway. But this is something important to the story, I guess. While she was a, a dazzling pageant winner on the outside, on the inside, oh boy. She could be charming and beautiful if she needed you, but mostly... She just treated people around her terribly, including my husband, and he eventually broke it off with her. But she just never really went away. She would continue to call and email repeatedly, even after my husband and I met. If anything, her calls increased, in fact. She would call over and over again, day and night, even after my husband, then boyfriend, blocked her number. She would ask for money and threaten to go to the police claiming that he abused her if he didn't give it to her. He obviously did not give her the money and this made her very upset. The threats increased and became more malicious. But when that didn't work, she would switch tactics and try and sweetly ask him for help with certain projects that she was trying to get off the ground. At this point, she now needed to generate an income. With the promise, too, that if he did just this one last thing for her, she would go away. He didn't reply. She would go back to being malicious, any tactic for attention, I suppose, or for what she really wanted, money. But my husband, he was terrified, because of course, while he never actually did anything to her, it would be her word over his, and he was terrified of ruining his reputation and career. We uh, unfortunately ended up in an event that she also attended. She'd been waiting for us to arrive and had placed herself near the entrance of the event. As we walked in, she stood across the room, looking me up and down and sort of laughing and whispering into the ear of her date, making a point to try and make me uncomfortable. But that was okay. She was easily ignored until, well, she ambushed me as I came out of the bathroom. 
She had clearly been waiting for a moment that I was alone. She towered over me too. She was very tall. I had no intention of having it out with her or anything, and as I hurriedly walked to find my husband, she kept pace beside me, hunched over, so she was at my eye level. I'm 5'5". Five five. Her head was also turned towards me. She was like a caricature of herself as she ambled beside me, smiling sort of maniacally. Where's your man? She hissed in her heavy accent. Her eyes were black and she looked like out of a Tim Burton movie, hunched over with that crazy demonic smile. Watch your back, Pug, she added, grinning. She liked to call me names like Pug because I own Pugs and I guess she thought that this was an insult. What I didn't know then was while I was in the bathroom, she had walked over to my husband and had thrown her arms around him while he was in mid-conversation with someone and introduced herself to the man that he was talking to as if she and my husband were together. My husband unwrapped himself from her clutches and told her to beat it. She then beelined and waited for me to come out of the washroom. We uh, stopped going to the parties after this. The last time that we ran into her though was at a funeral for a mutual friend. She followed me around at the wake and as my husband, boyfriend at the time, was talking to the man's widow, I was talking to a friend and his wife. She walked right up and stood with us, joining us mid-conversation as if she were part of the group or something. It was unnerving but also just really bizarre I guess. I mean it was a funeral and I didn't want to make a scene so I silently picked up my wine glass off the bar and walked away, leaving her with the couple that I'd been speaking to and her staring at me with a smirk on her face. All in all, it was really annoying, but it was manageable, I guess. However, the emails, calls, they never stopped. She would call my husband over and over, day and night, even though he had long blocked her number. She would even drive by. I found my car keyed one night after I left it outside too, but obviously I couldn't really prove that it was her. But enough was enough at this point. My husband had a lawyer send a cease and desist, and after the first, she called him from a private number. He answered, and she said, Hi, it's me, in a sort of sing-song voice like they were the best of friends, and he hadn't just sent her a lawyer's letter ordering her to stay away from him and he his family. He said nothing and hung up though and another cease and desist was sent and then a third. Nothing would make her go away it seemed though. I guess she just did not actually think that my husband was capable of not wanting to be with her because, you know, her beauty and all. Eventually though, she got really ticked off that he was not giving in. So she decided to take this rage to the internet. I knew that she was absolutely checking out my social media, but I don't really use it that much, so I didn't care. However, she created a fake Twitter account and tweeted, my husband's name is a fraud, and tagged his colleagues, friends, investors, family members, every single person that she could think of to try and ruin his reputation and career. On New Year's Eve, she posted on my Instagram account at exactly 12.01am, Happy New Year's scrud social media settings were all put to private though. We went to the police armed with emails threatening to give her money or she would go to the police and she was charged with two counts of harassment and a restraining order was put into place. To our shock though, the next day after her arrest, our phones were buzzing. This story had made front page news. Clearly it was a slow news day, right? Well, her day in court came right before COVID. We arrived to the courthouse and sort of sat down and she walked in. And we were shocked by her appearance. Actually, shocked is probably an understatement. She was unrecognizable from her former self. Gone was the statuesque dazzling blonde. She had apparently shaved her head and was wearing a short ratty brown wig. She had gained about 80 pounds, give or take and was now sort of hunched. With her height and new girth, she looked like a linebacker if I'm being honest. She wore a bulky brown overcoat and a scarf tied over her wig like a babushka. My immediate thought though was her outside now matches her inside, but it was her eyes that I noticed the most. 
About a year earlier, we had shown a photo of her to our kids so that if she ever approached them, they knew to run. At the time, my son, who was young, commented that she had mean eyes. From the mouth of babes, right? Maybe it was that she had changed so much physically overall, but her eyes were dark and narrowed into deep sort of black slits. As she scanned the courtroom and saw us in court, she would turn around every so often to look back at us and glare. She would then whisper in her lawyer's ear and laugh as if as she were having a grand time. We thought that she was putting on a brave face and treating it all like a joke, but we were about to find out that getting arrested would not slow her down. The restraining order didn't seem to faze her at all. If anything, I think it just angered her even more. But from then on, every day and night, she would post from multiple fake social media accounts, posting photos of myself, of my husband. She would put up my husband's photos with captions of pedophile or other terrible names. She posted altered and unflattening photos of myself. She called me old and ugly. Those are the G-rated ones too, mind you. And listen, I'm definitely no beauty queen myself. The name calling, while obsessive and gross, wasn't what bothered me most to be honest. Although, I'm not going to lie, seeing hundreds of photos of myself on her fake Twitter account calling me ugly and obsessively pointing out every single perceived flaw did succeed in getting me down at times. But why did I keep looking? Because it was like getting a glimpse into her unraveled mind, just in case it was a clue of what she was capable or thinking of doing next because it wasn't her insulting post that fazed me. What bothered me most were the sinister captions, like keep an eye on your kids because I'm watching, or why don't you plant some flowers in your front garden, or be good to your kids because you never know what could happen. How was your Uber Eats order? She would post pictures of me with an arrow directed to my head, which I perceived to be a gun to my head. She posted pictures of my husband's workplace, which she was not allowed to be near, in accordance to the restraining order, but the police said that this could just be a picture that she took from the internet. Right. She posted Agatha Christie quotes like, every killer is usually someone you know well, or your end is near. Her Twitter profile banner picture was taken from a movie poster and said stalker, like she was in on the joke. We called the police again, but they said that there wasn't anything that they could do since she didn't actually tag us. I took screenshots of everything. Many of her posts were just nonsensical, but most were photos posted of us on this fake account, all altered with derogatory or ominous captions. But still, we just couldn't shut her down. I became anxious any time my kids were outside shooting hoops in the driveway. My elderly mother wouldn't take the baby out in the stroller. She was too scared. It really affected all of our lives. Like, became dramatic. Ex-beauty queen would taunt us with catch me if you can. She posted close-ups of her dog's genitals or a piece of her dog's turds with my name beside it. The implication obvious. It really bothered me too that she now had a dog since I didn't think someone like her was capable of caring for anything living. But then the call started back up, this time to our home line. Yes, we still have a home line. We're one of those people. She would say nasty things and then just hang up. She would say things like karma will get you and then weird chant-like calls as if she was reciting a spell. Sure enough... She posted photos of a pentagram and candles as some sort of altar and the caption ring ring. Finally too, finally the police asked us to come in and give video statements. We gave them a drive containing thousands of screenshots of posts that she had made and they arrested her again and charged her with two more counts of criminal harassment. My husband was angry at this point but as a mama bear I just wanted to get this over with. She mentioned the kids frequently and ominously many times in her online rants, also calling them rude names, which I won't repeat here because these are the things that upset me the most. The judge also issued a social media ban for her. By the time that she was rearrested for the second time, 
Her fake Twitter account, which was literally mostly insults or references to my family, had 16,000 tweets in a three-month period. She has no followers, mind you, so they were just to herself. The adult sites I had been continuously being tagged on stopped, thankfully. The things quieted down tremendously, but I still get follower requests that I believe are her. But at this point, we were all on edge. And I kid you not, I felt weird walking into my kitchen at night to make a sandwich, feeling creeped out that she was outside watching or something. I put nothing past her as nothing is more dangerous than a desperate woman who has nothing to lose, right? Which, by the way, was one of the quotes that she posted. I don't know what is wrong with her. I believe from what I've researched that she's a malignant narcissist. Perhaps some other mental issues at play here, but I can say that she was a terrible person long before she decided to try and make her our lives miserable. Crazy beauty queen turned stalker. Uh, I would love nothing more than to never see you again, but if going to court helps you stay away from us forever, then bring it, I suppose. As an aside, I wanted to mention that we've heard from a reliable source that after my husband broke up with her, she allegedly became known to the police for other reasons too. What I mean is that while my husband dodged a bullet regarding her threats to go to the police saying that he abused her, apparently other men have not been so lucky.